Welcome to the Enlighten Up Podcast. I am your host, Nicole Frolic, and I invite you to cozy up with me each week as I explore all aspects of the spiritual journey, spiritual biohacking, and expanding the mind beyond this reality. Remember that the collective awakening can start by planting one seed. So thanks for being such an amazing audience and sharing these shows with your family and friends. So without further ado, let's jump right into the episode and find out what we're discovering today. Hey guys, welcome back to the Enlighten Up podcast. I'm really happy to have you back here with me. I have a really special guest to um, share with you all. Uh, You probably are aware of him uh, from his recent video that has gone viral on um, the pedophilia rings and the tunnels and child operations. Uh, But he's also known for being a heavyweight champion boxer and having an extremely high amount of knockouts um, in a first round. I believe it's 24. So David is also 25. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Well, David is um, also very spiritual, which is one of the reasons why I'm having him here on the show. Uh, We are going to talk a little bit about um, child trafficking. As you guys all know, it's near and dear to my heart in a sense of bringing it to light, especially after remembering some of my own sexual abuse recently as a kid. So without further ado, David, welcome to the Enlighten Up podcast. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Yeah. You know, when we were chatting on the phone um, earlier this week, uh, setting this all up, I, I, I got off the phone with you feeling like, man, I could just, I feel like I've been hanging out at barbecues all summer with this guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I am. I'm a Texas boy, man. Like, uh, you know, and being raised in El Paso where I'm from, it's, it's so different here. It's such a unique place. It's a, you know, we're sister cities with Juarez, Mexico. Uh, so, you know, I could throw a rock and hit Mexico and, and like all my friends are from there. And so I got, a, I grew up very diverse and, uh, you know, so I'm Mexicano, my father's Mexican. My mom is, is, is blonde like you. So I'm, I'm a mixture. So I grew up, uh, being bullied, you know, being the tallest kid in class and being the weddle and, and, uh, taking my share of beatings growing up. And then, uh, and then that's what you know, my dad put me into boxing and boom, it took off from there. And. And uh, I had a remarkable and exciting career. Wait, you were the tallest kid in the class and you got bullied? Yeah, I was, uh, I used to be like a string bean though. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I was like, I had those weird, awkward growth, uh, growth spurts that, that, uh, that uh, I, I was an awkward kid growing up, you know? So I didn't really feel into myself till high school. Oh my gosh. I totally relate to that because I was the tallest kid in my class forever. (laughs) Like it wasn't until high school until the guy started uh, passing me. So, um, okay. So let's get into this for the audience. Um, let's just kind of start off with your childhood. Um, because one of the things that I've realized through my own personal spiritual journey is how much that happens in our childhood shapes how we interact with our life in our adulthood. And a lot of that trauma as an adult, we maybe dismiss because we think it doesn't mean anything, but it, there's a lot that plays out later in life and there's a lot of healing that has to happen. So you being bullied, how did that, um, how did you transform that? And what was like the big learning lesson for you there? Ooh. Well, for me, um, it, it, you know, I was bullied from five years old on to probably junior high. And it was, uh, you know, the junior high that I went to, we went to, um, I went to a junior high that was, uh, you had the suburban kids going there and then you had the gangs going there. So we had gang, gangs, you know, the projects and then suburbia. We all went to the same school. So it was a very different kind of upbringing. So while I was there with like a, the gangs from Machuca, Jackie's, uh, Fatherless, uh, El Diablos, like all these gangs from Mexico that, you know, a lot of these people would come in from Mexico and live in the projects and then they, they, their kids would go to that same school that I went. So I was always getting, always getting jumped after school, having to run to from the bus stop to my house because kids would be chasing me and once they, you know, caught me, then <laughs> an ass whooping would proceed. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that was just my upbringing. And, and uh, it just turned me into a, you know, you have that, everyone has those instincts of, of fight or flight. And uh, most people don't have to live through an experience like that, you know, 
but I, I did, and and uh, I learned that you know when my back's against the wall, I I'd have to fight. I had no choice. Uh, so that instinct started to get buried in me, and it worked to my benefit when I turned into a, a heavyweight uh, fighter when I turned pro because then I became this like junkyard dog, like I was just mean, and and I turned in. I went from the bullied kid to the bully, and then I just loved getting in the fighter's head and just wishing, you know, making him wish he never even stepped foot in that ring, never even challenged me. And I just turned into a completely different person. Um, that took place. That's the way I was throughout my whole career. I was 36 and 0 and I was just destroying everybody. I was just a wrecking machine. And, um, it, my whole life changed when I was walking out of a bar one night after what my sixth championship, uh, fight and I won the, another belt and I was celebrating with friends and, at that time, I was I was really uh, juggling two extremes. I was drug, juggling drugs and alcohol and living a crazy life, fast women, friends, uh, party scene, and then being a pro athlete. And those two don't mix. It's like oil and water. You can't do that. But I thought at that time I could do anything, you know. And I was walking out of a bar one night, and I believe there's a confrontation, but I don't remember because I was so inebriated and so blacked out drunk. I was walking out of a bar, and... Uh, it was about two in the morning and these thugs came behind me and slit my throat and they cut me from my ear all the way into my, uh, I took 369 stitches and all of this, I mean, all of this was gone. This was just off. And, um, that night changed my life forever because I was bleeding out, uh, I think two, two and a half pints of blood or something like that. I was dying. I was gone. And, um, my friend saw what happened when they slit my throat and he comes running up like, Hey, what's going on here? And then I just see him go like this. And they, they started viciously stabbing him as well. And they got him, but he put up his arm. So he got it all in the arm. And then he fell on top of me. And then and it went from like a movie cent a moving like cinema reel to pictures. Like then I just started blacking out cause I was losing so much blood. And uh, I woke up in the ambulance and the paramedics were frantic and dropping the, the syringes and everything. And, telling me to stay with them, stay with them, stay with them. And then I just remember, that's all I remember that I just blacked out. And the next time I came conscious was when I was in the hospital and the doctor was standing over me, talking to me about what happened and telling me what happened in my face and this and that. And it was an experience I'll never forget. My And I even suffered from PTSD from that. And just trying to put this in a nutshell, but uh, that changed my life because after that, I went right back into the ring. I wasted no time. I didn't see a sports psychologist. I didn't see a therapist, nothing. I went right back in the ring and got knocked out. So talk about adding salt to the wound. You know, this unstoppable heavyweight that was on cloud nine all the time. And then all of a sudden I went from hero to zero and then came back again and got knocked out again. So now I'm 36 and two wondering what happened to my career, what happened to my life, not knowing who I am, lost my identity. Uh, didn't stop there. I went back in the ring and I won that fight and I knocked that guy out. I was finally a little more focused. I wasn't so emotional as I was and had a back injury that needed surgery. So then I'm in surgery <laughs> for an L405 fusion that ruined, that stopped everything. And then, um, that made me reflect on my life. Obviously God wanted, had other plans for me. And I had no choice but to go into another direction. And that was probably when I was about 37. So I'm 42 now. So five years of uh, darkness. Oh, well, about three years of darkness, really. And then I started coming out of it. So it was like a lot of, it was a huge growth period for me in the sense that I was developing. And I had to, God had to strip my identity completely of everything I knew and was. I thought I, at least I thought I was. I was in a bubble and recreate a different human being. And that's what happened to me. So I've become a completely different person. Uh, I went through a, I, anytime you're going through growth, it's painful. It's very painful. And that's what I went through. I went through a very, a very painful period of growth, depression, suicidal thoughts. Uh, I didn't know who I was anymore. I, I didn't even know I had no friends anymore. Like the friends that were around me in boxing were all entourage. Uh, guys that would come out with me, they would come out to my fights and they were my best friends. Hey, once I lost, they were no longer around anymore. Once I needed something, they didn't want to help me. Yeah. And I lost about 20 friends, you know, that I thought were, whoa, I have the luckiest guy alive. I had 20 best friends. Not true. I had maybe two. 
Uh, so that's what happened with me in a nutshell. And I recently, I mean, I'm talking really recently, I just started giving myself to God and my life to God more and making that transition because, or, you know, I've been going through transition, but now really settling in the fact that I have to do the right thing. I quit alcohol and drugs and I feel over 120 some days sober and, and I'm feeling good. And if I'm going to do this right and do it, I, I don't have, I don't feel I've got, I've gotten so many hall passes from God that I don't feel like I have anymore. So, so I need to do this right. The first, this time, this time I got to do it right. Yeah. You don't want to yeah. take advantage of uh, the good luck so to speak, it's already been there. And it's interesting because this happens a lot for people where you have um, divine intervention when you're really starting to quote unquote, go off the rails of life, kind of go off with the path that you, which when I say that, I don't mean that it was never part of your path. A lot of times we have to go to the darkest place in order to find the light within us again. Yeah, and absolutely. I think it's necessary. I, I mean, like so maybe there's you have some people listening right now that are going through a hard time especially this quarantine and they're depressed and they're going through the dark night of the soul i call it you know um and they don't feel like there's any way out they're thinking of suicide or whatever that you've got to use this time to self-explore and let god speak to you and your soul so you can come out the other end a better person it's like a cocoon of change and i went through it massively like gosh i'm talking stripped of everything i knew everything i was everything i grew i I was boxing at five years old so that's all i knew that's all that's the only person that's the only person i identified with was that boxer that had to be stripped away my ego gone and now um you know we all have a little ego but my the ego i used to have that was so massive is gone now it's it's like you know i see that i'm getting older there's things i can't do physically anymore um i just (laughs) <laughs> I'm becoming, I really feel like I'm becoming a better human being. I really do. Yeah, it's very humbling. And, you know, this idea, let's talk about this idea of identities being stripped away because we live in a world where they want to manufacture our own, our identities to fit in and be a certain way and act a certain way. And our authenticity is stripped from the moment we take our first breath in this world, pretty much, you know, whether it's through our parents' beliefs, through the school system, through media, like everything just starts to try to mold us into this manufactured identity that we need to be very similar, we need to all fit in. And a lot, a big part of the spiritual awakening for anyone is when you start to realize it's not who you are, it doesn't feel comfortable anymore, and you have to peel back all of the layers of that manufactured identity and find out who's really under there. Right. And I really, that reminds me of something that really, um, I feel really sorry for the generations today, the the young generations today, you know, the millennials and the, the generation under them, because gosh, their identity is social media. I mean, their identity is strictly uh, Instagram and Facebook and Snapchat and, and TikTok. I mean, how many followers they can have and, and, and this narcissistic uh, persona they have to play all the time of everyone thinks they're a celebrity. It's insane. It's like the self entitlement that we're dealing with now is dangerous and they're going to have the roughest time because either they're going to be sucked into the machine into like this AI that's coming, you know, it's on its way. Um, it's already here really, but it's, it's progressing so fast and not ever know who they are as a human being or they need to snap out of it and, and start having more social interactions and, being around their family more like like that right in quarantine instead of being on the computer all day be around your family learn what you like to do go outside go for a walk go run go work out go uh go do things with uh, your your friends don't spend all your time staring at your phone you know and i think that's a real identity that they're going to be battling with i think that's going to be in the future that's going to be a very hard thing to break because they're trapped in that now their, their humanity is trapped with that with with this this mm-hmm. this is their identity and a lot and we suffer from it you know a lot of people our age are suffering from it, but at least i have a point of reference to when um on um, pre-internet you know i remember back in the my i like to say the last great decade was the 90s <laughs> and and then like and then you got the the post-internet right and then so that was the first conscious change the first uh 
spontaneous evolution, spontaneous jump for humanity was boom, internet, and then everything started coming in a million times faster information wise. Then we hit a point now where it's quarantined, you know, and this is going to be another spontaneous jump for humanity in the sense that we're going through a spiritual awakening. We're starting to pay attention to things we never paid attention to before, like this pedophilia. Uh, and people aren't distracted by bread and circus anymore, like they used to say in Rome. People are not distracted by football games, basketball games, uh, the, the, the Oscars, the Grammys, none of that, movies. They're now focused on what's real in their life. And this is going to make, either make us take a left turn or a right turn. And it's a very important time for humanity. And I'm just glad to be a part of it. And I'm glad I had a spark in the conscious awakening with a pedophilia uh, issue. Um, you know, what I thought when I, when I was out there in my backyard talking, I thought that everyone knew this subject. I thought that it was common sense. Wow, was I in for a surprise when people didn't even, when people were so shocked at what I was saying. To me, it was common knowledge. People knew this, you know, in the circles that I ran with. So. So I think we're on a I think we're on a trajectory now, positive trajectory. But I believe the millennials and the generation under them are going to have the hardest time coming out of this this uh, this identity crisis they're going through that is all absorbed with this. Yeah, yeah, and you know, like I think what's happening, what I what I truly believe is what's going to um, mend the divide. Okay, that the polarization that's happening, the extreme polarization that we're seeing right now is the children. I feel like they're the keystone to actually bring humanity back together because I don't understand how anyone can politicize children beyond like, you know, obviously we see like the kids in cages thing and all that kind of stuff. But I mean, when you're talking about torture and um, rape and satanic rituals of these children, uh, like people need to wake up and uh, it, nothing has really been done until this current administration, which to me, I'm starting to see is one of the wake up points, whether you are in favor of the current administration or not, a lot of people are starting to realize that this can't go on with the children. And it's a very dark stain on humanity, on our psyche. There's no way that we can all heal until we bring out the darkest shadow that I feel plagues this entire planet. And that kind of like goes into this idea of, we were talking on the phone um, earlier this week about how a lot of people want to just be positive about things and only focus on the positive and how it's really important that we start paying attention to also the darkness, the demons. If you're not willing to face the truth about just your own personal demons, how do you expect the truth to be exposed on all of the demons we're fighting outside of us? Right. Life is not all about rainbows and unicorns. You know, it's not, it's not about that. We got to expose the darkness. We got to pay attention to it. We got to know it's there. It's a necessary uh, polar opposite. You know, there's dark and light without each other. They don't exist. So you're always going to have darkness. It's just how, but you can't be so, uh, Oh, I only, you know, a lot of these new, this new age movement, people are like, Oh, I only uh, practice the positivity. I don't go around people that are negative, this and that you need to, understand the trenches out there and who's in there and you got to help people this is what's why we're here on this planet is to help other people you can't just conveniently just uh this cognitive dissonance and this uh conveniently neglect uh people that are struggling that's what's wrong with humanity we're only as strong as our weakest link so you know you know a lot of times my friends will tell me dude why do you give homeless people money you could tell he's a drunk i go i don't care what he does with the money once i give it to him that's not my problem uh i don't like to see a fellow human beings suffering like that so i like to you know if he goes and buys a beer dude have enjoy the beer <laughs> i don't care you know like to me it's just I, that sucks he wouldn't be out there anyway if he wasn't struggling yeah you know they make more money than we do i go well that's a shitty job if he has to stand out there and make money that way because i wouldn't want to do that that's humiliating so we need to the whole purpose that you know and, and why jesus came and, and and teach the things he taught was that we can't live a life where we think we're better than thou and I'm on a higher vibration and I don't need to be around the lower vibrational people. No, you, you I believe, and this is me speaking here. I, I love my friends in low places and I, and I love hanging out with them and, and being around them much more than I do with my friends in higher places. I can't stand some of those, those pricks, you know, these people that, you know, I love being around people that, that bring me back down to the salt of the earth, man, like 
roots. You know what I mean? And I, I love being around those people. And if they're in a bind or whatever, hey, man, I've been in binds. I've suffered terribly, terribly in my life. And only a few people came to help me. And I've always just wanted to be that guy that can reach, extend a hand, not be taken advantage of, because it's easy to be taken advantage. You got to love yourself too. But I like to help people and, and bring them back up if you can. And, and I think that we all need to kind of, we all need to do that. I, I think that that's one of the main teachings of Jesus. And I see these, uh, these, these preachers, let's just say, teaching to stay positive and, you know, eagles don't surround themselves with turkeys and this and that and prosperity preachers. Right. And I'm thinking that is so against what Jesus taught. And I, I just, I can't even turn on the TV and watch these guys. I, 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 uh, for me, it's, uh, sometimes you need to get your hands dirty, you know, maybe go down to a, a homeless shelter and serve them food and be around them and, and hear their stories, sit and talk to them. You'd be shocked that it can happen to anybody, anybody in any, you hit the right button. Anybody can be homeless. So I don't know. That's just my two cents on that. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you. And I think that this idea of like, you wanting to keep a high vibration, sure, because it's important to stay in a state where you're creating from a higher place. But that doesn't mean that you can't help others who are in a lower state of frequency. So like whether it's grief or shame or apathy, you know, that's, those are the people that need it the most. But you said something there that's really important in the sense of we can't judge anyone for their path of where they are right now. Because for me personally, if people knew, actually, people who knew me in my 20s probably would be shocked to hear me talk right now. I was like a bartender at like the biggest <laughs> nightclub in Toronto. I was getting drunk five nights out of the week. I was a total club kid, you know, like I just wanted to party. I loved going down to South Beach and just doing all these things that now it just, I can't handle it anymore. Like I, I don't have yeah. any interest in that. Um, yeah. But like, you grow that, up. Was, yeah, <laughs> that was my path, you know, like of just getting completely drunk. I was, but I was numbing a lot of stuff I didn't want to face within my own self. Yeah. And we have to understand that sometimes people need to go to it's, I found the people who've allowed themselves to go to the darkest places end up being some of the brightest lights on this planet. Absolutely. And when I see yeah, someone well. who's stuck in ego, Sometimes I'm like, oh, there's a spiritual teacher in the making, you know, like. Yeah, yeah. Ego, ugh, that's a and that's a tough thing. To, I mean, we all go through, but that's a tough thing to break. It's hard because uh, everyone has their ego and, and uh, it's something that's your identity, you know. And when you lose that, when you have to be stripped of it, ooh, that's a hard process. That's not fun. It is <laughs> not fun. And especially for a fighter. Oh, those guys. Every fighter I know, there's two fight. There's two kinds of fighters, either the really humble fighter, or you got the which you you know he's very humble and a hard upbringing, and he's been knocked out, he's been down and out, or you have the highly egotistical fighter, the megalomaniac. You got those two, and uh, one you, you'd love to be around, and the other you can't stand to be around. <laughs> you know, so you know I. I got to say, I was a megalomaniac at one point. I wasn't a fun guy. Wouldn't you say, though, that the key, the key to, like, really overcoming that is to embrace the megalomaniac, you know, to really kind of pull, and pull that part of you in and kind of, like, compassion, love it, as opposed to try to pretend it doesn't even exist? Well, it's an illusion. It doesn't exist. It's only the perception in your mind. You know, it doesn't exist. It's fake. What's real is your soul and your spirit and what you do for people and, and what you take with you when you pass on, you know, like, like your, your ego does not exist, man. It's, it's a facade. It's a, it's a, it's an illusion. And athletes have the biggest ego on this planet. Um, I personally, like I've been around a lot of celebrities and athletes. I can't, st I can't stand to be around them. They are, oh God, they, they'll make you sick. Well, this is, there's some good ones. Usually the, the celebrities that are the funnest to be around are the, the older celebrities that had that fame and lost it. Uh, kind of just dealing with regular life now. Um, I had a best friend that passed a, a best friend that died when he was 29. He died in his sleep. His name was Preston Hartzog. And uh, he was a boxer and he was one of my 
very best friends, man. He had a personality. He walked into a room. He lit it up. Big dude, six five. We're about the same. You know, we, we both of us are like just peas in a pod, man. But this guy had a personality that would just light up a room. His um, his brother in law was John Goodman, and I got to spend some time with John Goodman a few times. And that guy, man, what a what a great guy that guy was. That's probably my one of the my favorite celebrities to be around with John Goodman because. The, him and Preston had the same personality. Like Preston, maybe was trying to emulate him or something. But, but uh, gosh, what fun people, man! Um, and there's a few that I can say that are just great people. And then there's a lot. There's a lot that are just. It's usually the younger, good-looking type celebrities that are just. Oh, it's just so full of themselves that you're just like, ah, get away. You don't want to be around longer than an hour. That's all you could take. Yeah, no substance whatsoever. No. <laughs> But John uh, yeah. Goodman, man, he was, uh, last time I talked to him was at Preston's funeral, but he told me, he was like, you're going places, man. And he he was a, uh, God, what a fun guy. I don't know, like one of my favorite movies was Big Lebowski and all that. And so was Preston's. So yeah, that dude was a great dude. I don't know where I went off on that one. Sorry, but <laughs> just remembering no, that's back. awesome. Well, yeah. I think it's important because celebrity culture is a huge part of the problem. And um, it's it's like Love that illusion. worship. Yeah. Celebrity it's, worship. Yeah. It's worse. It's worse being false idols. Um, and it's this and idea. And they're propped up that way for a reason. And then it's gotten to the point now where when you're a celebrity, it's either you play ball by the, these handlers that the way they want you to play ball or you're not a celebrity anymore. And they create that attention so much that they stay playing ball. Even if they're, their soul wants out of it, they, their ego is overcome. Like their ego, their ego is so much stronger than their real true identity that their ego just keeps pulling them into this uh, realm that's demonic. It's yeah. demonic. Can I ask you a question? And of course, don't answer if you don't feel comfortable doing it, but this just kind of came okay. in. Um, have you noticed just from your own experience, the because what I'm seeing from, I, I, what I believe is happening is that celebrities are starting to realize they're being worshiped less and less and that there's this um, crumbling of their own identities or, or worth happening right below their feet, basically. Is, do, you, do you sense or get any insight into some of the fear around that perception that everything that they thought was going to boast them up and hold them up on a pedestal, that people aren't really going to the movies anymore, people don't want to listen to what you have to say if you're a celebrity as much as they used to, like, where do you, what or even just what are your you thoughts? What, I think I I think now especially with this little rock I threw at them, <laughs> I think I've heard that there's a lot of celebrities out there that their feed is just getting filled with hate now on Twitter, and uh, I'm like I said I'm going to be very careful not to name names, but like there's a few of them that are out there that are just getting railed on right now, and actually hated and despised. Um, but people are waking up, you know, and that's, that's the problem. Like this whole illusion, Hollywood, I mean, it's a fake, it's an illusion. The whole thing's an illusion. They sell you an illusion and you buy it. And people think that celebrities have this voice when they don't, they're just puppets. You know, they're just willing to do things that you were not willing to do to be famous. A lot of them. And so you get, people need to understand that. But yeah, I think now the whole system's crashing down for sure. Um, yeah, people are still going to want to be entertained and go to movies, but I think it's going to be now the celebrities that are going to be, uh, respected. I'm not going to say worshiped are the ones that are like real mm -hmm. and don't, and just come, come with it. Just come with the rawness and being blunt and not being this fake person. People don't care about that anymore. You know what I mean? People, people see through that shit now and it's, and it's honest. And I think that, uh, more so now than ever, I think now it's happening during this quarantine where people are like, you know what? Come to think of it, yeah, I used to like that person, but why? Why did I like them? And start thinking about it, and I'm like, you know what? I don't think I'm going to watch any of her videos or, me or listen to her music anymore. Yeah. They're starting to think of themselves. They're not just being led into it like the sheep to a slaughter. You know, that's, that brings us into a good, good place of opening up this idea where, you know, you went from hero to zero, especially like even within your friends, and realizing, wow, all the friends that I thought were my friends aren't my friends. And this happens a lot. Oh, and then the ones that even turn on you. I mean, I had friends turn on me. Which oh, was, wow. Wow. That's a whole nother That level. was hard. Yeah. Yeah. And I've actually experienced that myself, not to the anywhere near the degree you have. But that idea of where, like, as soon as you start 
um, well, if you lose your value and what they perceive as valuable about you, um, and then also you start really becoming more true to who you are and willing to speak a truth that you may have been scared to speak in the past. And that can be anything. Um, it could be just your perception of things, uh, different belief systems. All of a sudden people start shaming you um, by, I, I was shamed into just for having a very neutral position was told like you belong, like I'm really worried about your mental state of being. I think you need to be checked into a mental like hospital. I mean, I'm talking about really good friends and family members who've known me my whole life. And just because I challenged a belief system. So what, what is happening here? What is your take on how this idea of as people start to awaken to who they truly are and start to shed the illusion of what they've made themselves out to be, what the ego wants them to believe they are. And you go through this losing of friends, like what's your advice to people who are going through that as someone who's been through it and now kind of coming out of it? Uh, it's like a snake shedding his skin. It's like the people that fall off, you let them. Don't even try to go back and ask why or why are you not talking to me? How, how did this happen? What? It's like a breakup. If someone leaves you, let them leave, let them walk. They don't see your value, then screw them. You know, you're changing. We're constantly always changing. Um, and and I've and I'm fine with that. Like it hurt me when it first happened to me because my like I said, my identity was purely the boxer. Uh, now uh, I'm bringing, I'm attracting people. Now that man, they're they have such a higher value to me. They're like such better people. They're not all about hey champ, let's go have a beer, man. Let's let me buy you a shot. Hey champ, hey champ. None of that stuff anymore. Now it's 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 David. Like. <laughs> Like, let's go hang out. Let's go, let's go do this. It's going to be, oh, you're not drinking. I respect that. You know, like those are the friends I want, you know, the friends that were always out, like, come on, get hammered with me, dude. Why don't you drink? I'm like, dude, you don't have my best interest. I'll be, I'm not drinking. I am not drinking. What don't you understand? Like, so it's like now the friends that I'm attracting uh, are better people, you know? And when I have a friend that let's say loves to drink and that's all he does calls me and wants to hang out. I'm like, dude, I'll hang out with you uh and and i go but listen i'm not drinking you could drink i'll drive you they still don't want to be around that because like misery loves company you know and they 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 still don't want to be around a guy that's sober while they're drinking you know but whatever well, I'm still because fun guy. you're no longer the yes man in their like yeah. camaraderie right and they're now forced yeah. to look at their own choices because someone's not choosing what they're choosing and that's a yeah good thing. and let me tell you i'm sick of it I, i'm sick of you know, almost getting in fights or not going to do that at the bar, or hurting my hand or like I could go to jail or or uh, getting a DUI, you know, like I do. I don't want that life anymore. I'm done with it. You know, I don't even know why. Like, I don't understand how I didn't quit earlier. I don't understand that. I'm like, why did it take so long? You know, like for me to finally get it. That is the question everyone asks themselves when they finally get to that place, because there's so much more peace. There's so much yeah. more happiness and like your eyes open to everything. Like the veils pulled back. You're like, Holy crap. You just see people slumbering through their lives being like basically automatons, like to go another job that they hate or like having relationships with people they don't like. And, you know, engaging in conversations that are like mind numbing. Yeah. And you know, what's funny too. People ask me like, Hey man, how did you quit drinking alcohol? I'm like, I just quit cold turkey. I made the decision. So well, I'm trying to quit. I'm like, it's not okay. There's alcoholics that need it every day. I was a binge drinker. I'd go out with my friends and socially drink and be hammered. If I wasn't plastered, almost falling off a bar stool, then I wasn't doing, I wasn't drinking properly, you know? <laughs> so there's those, those drinkers too, but that's also an alcoholic. Uh, so you got to identify that and say, okay, I know I have this problem. But then I think what people really struggle with, and this is the thing, like I'm able to go into a bar and have a good time without drinking. Not many people can do that. Not many people can go to a bar and actually have drinks shoved in their face and say no. So what people really battle with is peer pressure. So that's what I've realized. I'm like, wait a second, dude, this really not, the problem is really not alcohol. It's the fear of not fitting in. It's the fear of being at the, it's, it's the fear of being at a bar and just feeling awkward and like you got anxiety and everyone's getting hammered, having a good time. And then they start driving, shoving drinks in your face and you're like, you know what? Gosh, forget it. I'll just drink it. Forget it. I'll, you know, I'll try again tomorrow or something. That's the problem is peer pressure. 
And it takes a, a certain type of individual with strength to say no. And, and a, a type of extrovert to be able to like hang out and have a good time. I'm a big dude. So people don't really like, if I say no, they're usually like, Oh, okay, dude, you know what I mean? But I, I'm confident. I'm not like this guy that can be pushed into things. You know what I'm saying? So I feel for people that get pushed into it. So that's really what I think people are struggling with is mm-hmm. peer pressure. I, I really believe that. I think people can stop if they just weren't bombarded with drinks in their face and friends that want to be obnoxious. Come on, just let loose. And they, deep down inside, they really want to quit, but they can't because they have friends that are drinking and they want to be part of the scene and they want to have a good time and their anxiety is through the roof. They want to calm the anxiety. So they start drinking. So it's peer pressure. In my opinion, I think that's what it is. It has to be. Yeah, it's definitely part of it. And I think, um, I think that, you know, one of the things I've realized too, when I started to just be true to who I am and not hold back, like, I'm just going to be me. I'm going to talk about what I want. I'm not going to force it on anyone, but I'm just going to be me. And I started like you, like started to attract people who were really like dig, digging that vibe, you know? Yeah. And, they, and cause that's who they are as well. And all of a sudden I had a smaller group of friends, but a solid core, like people I know right. have my back now. And, um, and that's like one of the benefits where I know like for anyone out there who's kind of going through this and feels lonely and doesn't want to like be alone or feel like they're not going to have any friends left or people that support them, believe me that that is temporary and what's coming after that is so much better than you can imagine. Yeah. You got to go through the growth. Yeah. So let's talk about this. You on your website say, and you, this is kind of like your whole like motto is never give up and always show up. And that kind of speaks to what you were just talking about. Like, how are you, how are you not drinking? How do you do this? There, this is like the mentality of a hero and everyone has the hero within them. I just released a video on my YouTube channel, um, the hero awakens. And it was kind of like this inspirational video I wanted to create for people to really like, you are being called right now to show up in your life in some form or fashion that this world needs you. And the only thing holding you back is you and the choices that you're making. Right. So how do, what kind of choices did you make that really exemplified this kind of never give up and always show up that it really kind of well, stick out in your mind. The reason I, the reason that quote is so special to me is because I had really amazing trainers and I don't want to say trainers cause there's many, many MMA and boxing trainers out there and they're, but they're not teachers. And it's important to have a teacher and mentor in your life. When I was this, when I was a young kid growing up, I had men in my life that were mentors, older brothers, you know, that, that like, not brothers, I don't have brothers, I have sisters, but men that came into my life that were like pillars of strength for me and for me to men that were there to mentor me. Joe Sullivan, uh, Louis Burke, uh, they all played a role, a defining role in my life. And one of the things that Louis Burke, who was a, in the 1980s, he was an amazing fighter. He was a, a world champion fighter. He fought Hector Camacho, Macho Camacho. He fought all the best fighters in the 80s when boxing was a really tough sport in the 80s you know they went 15 rounds and I used to be sometimes I mean we were training three times a day every day and this was a lifestyle I mean I'm talking get up at five go for your five six mile run come back eat breakfast sleep get back up again at 12 or one go to the gym train two hours come back sleep get up again around six eat go stretch uh, stretch out your, your fine-tuned machine when you're fighting. I mean, this is every day. No women, no sex, no no link, no drinking. When I'm in camp, I'm in camp. And there was days where I'd ask him, like, Louie, gosh, I just really, I'm tired today, man. He's like, I don't want to hear that. He's like, I don't want to hear that. You're going to be tired. You're supposed to be tired. Just show up. And I was like, yeah, but what do you, and I used to be like, just show up. And, and the reason you just show up is because it'll take itself from there. And some of my best workouts or when I would just show up exhausted, dog tired, and I had to spar that day against a guy that's like number five in the world, number three in the world, and I'd be like, oh, man, I'm going to get my ass kicked today. And I would show up and have the best day. Just, I don't know. It's like it, something kicks in, and, and you just go. And then it becomes a routine, and just the, the, the line, just show up, is no matter how you feel, no matter dog ass tired you are, you just show up to the gym, and it takes itself from there. I used to go to the gym sometimes scared to death. Like, oh, man, I got to spar this guy. This guy's tough. 
And when I say spar, it's not pity pat like people associate with. No, we go green light, which means trying to knock each other out in the gym. And we'd have some of the toughest gym wars that were better than my fights on TV, like in the gym that were just, oh, gosh. I don't miss those days. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> so, like, I don't miss oh some of that. God. Oh, geez, man. God, well, I was 19, 20 years old. I was having to spar these guys that were like 28, 30 that were just monsters, like number five, number six in the world. And I'm just like, oh, yeah, that was, I don't really miss those days. <laughs> well, I think it's important for people to keep in mind that if you want to be better, you have to act better. And it doesn't happen overnight. Everything that gets imprinted into us, you know, into our character, into our personality comes through repetitive behavior. And you have to subcon you have to program the subconscious to be a hero on autopilot for an extended period of time in order for it to take shape. Yeah. And I think people we live in a we live in a world that is so dependent on instant gratification but they're not willing to put in the work or like the effort or if they, or they easily get dis discouraged. Right. And it kind of reminds me of this. Like when I was about 13 or 14 years old, I told my dad, I go, dad, um, you know, I've been boxing all my life. I've had some amateur fights. Uh, I think I'm going to be a boxer. And he was like, what? And I was like, yeah. Cause my dad didn't want me to do that. He wanted me to be in real estate. Like he did. Uh, he, you know, we have a lot of properties that we own this and that. He's like, no, 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 son. What are you talking about? You know, use your mind to think not to get beat on. And I'm like, no, I, I want to be, I had to follow my heart. So I did. And I remember staring up, like we live on the mountain and like the, the, the base of the mountain. I remember staring up into the mountain and thinking to myself, I'm going to start running that every day. And then I was, and, and I was like, gosh, I mean, <laughs> it's like this. Right. And, and I was like, I don't know. I'm going to get to a point where I can, I can actually run it and finish it. And I remember that dream, that little, mustard seed of a dream turned into be a, a fabulous career. And I remember when I first started, the first time I ever set foot to run the mountain, the first time in my life, it started with one step, right? It just takes one step. And it just, that first step of the, of the, of, of, of intention of running that mountain became a lifestyle for me. And that one step turned into five miles up the mountain to where I can run it. No problem. And it's just amazing to me how, how dreams start and, they, and how they flourished because that was just my mind and my, where energy, you know, where, where focus goes, energy flows. And I just remember thinking, I'm going to run this mountain. I'm going to start on this day. I was 13 years old. And then it just became a routine and it, I built my legs strong, built my willpower and it became a lifestyle. And I just, I just, it's amazing what people can do, what humans can do if they set their mind to it. And don't look at the mountain itself. Like, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, my mom always used to say. Don't think of the whole elephant. Just one bite at a time. And when you run the mountain, it's one step at a time. So it's just, uh, if anybody, if people want to change and, go and, and, and really focus on manifesting dreams, it's one step at a time. You don't look at the whole mountain. You just take it one step at a time. And that's my philosophy on that. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And... So I'm curious, I, I know you're really into kind of spirituality and how you have a very open mind about a lot of things. How, how versed are you in like timelines and things like that? The conversation around timelines. Yeah, I'm versed in that. So, do, so, you know, when we talk about timelines and understanding that we're constantly creating our own reality and through right. your own choices, you could be moving into a more positive timeline, a timeline of more success, a timeline of more happiness, more love, or you could be moving into a timeline of more self-destruction uh, where you see more fear and all of that, depending on a lot of your choices. And maybe all these timelines coexist together, you know, like they're all parallel, uh, you know, multiverses, right? We're all living in this, in this, in this uh, infinity of consciousness that it's, it's, we're co-creators, but at the same time, we're constantly creating in different timelines and we have different versions of ourselves doing different things. And it's a holographic universe. So are you talking about that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. How, would, yeah. how would you explain that to someone who's really kind of new to the idea of timelines and understand that whole concept that, wait a second, there's not just one version of me all the time doing like. Yeah. I mean, there's a version of you that it's like the butterfly effect, you know, it's kind of like there's a version of you that did something else at this period of time and went in a different timeline. I always think that when I got 
almost murdered and I got my throat cut open, I fell into an alternate timeline. And this is the timeline I'm in. And there's another David living a timeline where that didn't happen. And I became heavyweight champion of the world and it's a whole different life. Damn it. Why did I go? <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it's like, it's like, yeah, I mean, I think that's completely plausible. And I do believe that. I, I think, uh, um, you know, we, we do live in a holographic type universe and I believe there's multiverses and, but that's deep. That's a really deep subject when you're just bringing someone in. Yeah. Uh, you got to mm -hmm. kind of reel it in and keep it surface level. You know, I'm a firm believer in Christ. And I believe that the the teachings of Christ isn't about religion. It's not about going to church and praying, doing this right, doing that right. It's about understanding your faults as a human being and understanding that you are part of God no matter what. And just accepting that. That's what Christ was teaching. It's not about do this, do that, and do this. And these are the rules. Jesus was just teaching, in my opinion, that you're already perfect. You're already from God. And no matter what you do, no matter how you screw up, you can never break the connection of God. You just have to repent and say, I'm sorry, I'll do better the next time. And understand that you're always forgiven. That's my view on that. I don't yeah. think it gets any more complex. I think it's pretty simple. And when you accept Christ, you're just ex you're accepting really the Christ consciousness of, of, um, of being uh, an imperfect person person but you're per you do imperfect things but you're already perfect you're part of god god is perfect so we screw up we're here to learn and it's a test i believe life is a test and we evolve into you know and, and then that that goes even deeper but i mean we could go all day on this right but yeah but, um, i mean this i mean once you start going down this rabbit hole it's like blah, blah, you, you can open up to you open pandora's box you can go in any direction <laughs> yeah, well, it's interesting because when it comes to timelines, um, I was actually speaking to Laura Eisenhower last night on the phone. And, um, you know, I saw her put out a post yesterday uh, about her video about like kind of a message to people who don't have any awareness about child trafficking. And, you know, like, you've got to open your mind, you've got to like, stay like, open to the possibility because it's there. And I kind of got this message, like I, I was writing a comment on her, on her thing about, yeah, and to all the, pe the pedos out there, we're going to find you in every timeline. Like there's no timeline you can hide in. Like we're coming into all yeah, those yeah, timelines. Yeah. And I got a download last week about dreams and how like even in our dream state, we're working on alternate timelines and cleaning things up, not just in the one you're actually physically right. conscious of. And you know I just, what's crazy too is that, and this is something that I've just recently, recently experienced. I now like turn off my phone from like ten at night or like nine thirty at night till about nine thirty the next morning because I feel like when I have my phone around me or I'm around electronics, I don't download information properly. Like when I'm more in touch with God and I'm quiet and I'm still, like when I'm outside gardening or like a putting plants in the earth and being in, with God in that sense. That's the real downloads. That's the real connection right there. This takes you away. This takes you away from the connection. Dude, I so can't agree more. If we can use this as a tool to like get out there to the mass, mass population or other people out there. But if you're going to download from the ethernet of conscious, super consciousness, I think you have to be still and quiet and away from these electronics and really be in touch with source. Does that make sense? Like I just, I've been feeling that recently and I'm like, Oh, 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 and not drink. I, so keep your body pure. So your, so your senses are up and your intuitions heightened and you're like Jedi mind and you don't have any toxins in your body. And, and that, that automatically lives to the better vibration and then being away from the electronics oh man i have been so keen and so like boom, over it's like now i'm half of like enlightenment that's just a you know maybe people listen to your program like what's a download it's a download is when you get this truth in your soul and you understand it like a message and you get it and it's like a, a voice speaking to you this, and all of a sudden it's like bing it hits you and you're like oh that's a download mm -hmm. like you know oprah says aha moments away from these electronics that's me mm -hmm. that's how i feel that's just really best way i can explain it 
Yeah. And uh, you were, you were definitely speaking some truth there because it was screwing with the connection. So you were going into some high vibe oh. <laughs> explanations. Yeah. They're like, oh, lower the vibration. Yeah. Cause like, I, I'm pretty sure people will catch that, but this idea, like, I think that's what, you know, people are like, what's a download? When do I receive a download? When am I going to know that I'm getting a download? It's like, it's just, it, it's like information that comes into your mind, like a thought sometimes, but you know, it's not you thinking it, it was put right. there. And it's like, boom, it gets put there. Exactly. Yeah. And sometimes you don't, it'll be information that you don't even have awareness of or any context around what it is sometimes. Exactly. So it um, can come in dreams too. It comes in at night when you're asleep, you get those downloads as well. Like, have you ever woken up out of a dream and then all of a sudden you get this truth bing, and you're like, wow. Or like, I swear to God, like sometimes I'll get like a, a song in my head that I've never heard before. And I'm like, dude, if I was like a musician, that song would be a hit. You know what I mean? I'd be like, gosh, I've never heard that before. You know what I mean? Like I, I'm creating songs in my dreams and I'm like, geez, if I could just know how to strum a guitar, you know, I can make something out of this. It's like crazy. Like, yeah, these downloads are awesome. But it's such an amazing thing. And really, and listen, I'm not harping on quit drinking alcohol. Like my sister loves to have a glass of wine with an Italian meal. Props to her. I think that's amazing. I wish I could. I, I probably could, but I don't want to because I'm so dead set on this Jedi mind and like these downloads and like my life going into such a positive direction that Dave with alcohol doesn't mix. <laughs> it's just not a thing I want to do. That and too, I think that because of um, what you've been talking about recently and what you've been putting out there, you just want to have as clear a mind as possible and your senses up at all times. Like you want to be aware of everything going on around you. Right. And right now during this quarantine, like what do people have to lose? I mean, better yourself right now. Go for it. Try it. Just give it a shot. Let's see. Let's see what happens. Give it experiment a little bit. Stop taking those drugs. Stop what you what you think you are in bondage to you're not it's all it's all up here it's all up here if you don't if you decide you don't need it you don't need it anymore and i'm also and i'm also dead set with antidepressants because they used to have me on antidepressants when i was a kid uh man I, they tried every antidepressant on the book with me and i thought i needed them until i decided i don't need them anymore <laughs> it was that easy i just decided i didn't need them anymore no, yeah, I, I know people have chemical imbalances, this and that. And believe me, I was one of those people. But I, I, I just came to terms with God made me a certain way and I'm wired a certain way and I deal with it. And, and I have my ups and downs like everybody does, mm -hmm. but I don't put pills in my body anymore. I, I'm, I'm more about being clean. And that's where the vaccinations come in too, if you want to talk about that. A yeah, little. I'm, I'm all game about that. Let's go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so... Do vaccinations help? Absolutely. And I'm not a doctor to give advice on that or nothing, but it, here's my own theories on it. Yeah. In the beginning, vaccinations did help you and they, and they still do to an extent, obviously, but now it's become more about control. And my, and the way I see it, it's more about control and conditioning you to take what the government gives you. Like, so if you drive, you know, I drive by a Walgreens, like let's say like two years ago, a year ago, and you'll see free, free flu shot, free this, free that, come and get you. All that's doing is conditioning a society, like the social distancing and social conditioning. That's all they're doing to you. And to accept being a drone, you know, even schooling. The schooling now is so liberal and it's an indoctrination. They're indoctrinating children to think the way they want them to think and to accept these mandatory vaccinations. Look I'm not claiming to know what's in the, in the vaccination that's coming for COVID, but I'm not taking it mm -mm. because I understand mm -mm. that it was a bioweapon and it was used precisely for what's happening right now, the social conditioning, which we're going through right now. And I know about nanotechnology. I understand that they have the technology now that it's nanoparticles. I mean, that's crazy. Yeah. Microscopic, yeah. subatomic. I mean, that that's the technology they're using now and you don't know what's going in your body and listen i don't trust anything that comes from the government nothing who are they it's not my dad it's not my mom i don't know who this entity is but i do know the evil that's behind it i know that the people that you know the, the people that are in the government in the higher echelon they're they're sick people they're they're psychopaths so no i'm not going to take what they force upon me and i hope and i think that revolution is coming to where there's going to be people that are 
the ex vaccinators they ex the yes they, they they want to be called ex vaxxers and vaxxers um and that's going to be a, a big line of division right there because there's gonna be a lot of people saying you're crazy we got to stop this disease i'm gonna go get vaccinated and there's gonna be a lot of people that are like hell no you're crazy i'm not gonna go put that in my body i don't know what they're pushing i know all this happened for a reason i know this was a bio attack on americans to take away our rights and now and what's going to happen is bill gates so this is a timeline we can go into we are talking about timelines one timeline is we fight against this and and I believe the timeline Trump is pushing us towards is freedom of this. We're mm -hmm. not going to be in bondage of this. I believe we're going in, we're fighting it right now, taking down the pedophilia rings. You know, a lot of people don't believe in the Q movement. I, I subscribe to not all of it, but some of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that we're going to, I think some arrests are going to be made. I think Trump is working hard to do this and bring us back to a republic. But then there's going to be people who live in fear and go in this other direction that are no, 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 the, 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 the disease is real. And I'm not saying it's not real. I know it's out there, but they're going to go fall right into the, the, the sheep being led to the slaughter. No, I, I can't, my kids can't get, they can't go to school unless they get mandatory vaccinations. Oh, we can't go to, we can't go to an NFL football game anymore until we get vaccinated. There's going to be a digital certification that Bill Gates is pushing, who also has the patent on the, on the vaccination, who's pushing this bullshit about you can't go to a football game. You can't go to basketball. You can't travel. Basically taking away your freedoms unless you get vaccinated. Now tell me if that's not the mark of the beast if there is one. Yep. It's um it's coming down real, it's real fast. Like, well, I mean, it's it's quite clear to me. I never thought I would live in a in a in a world. <laughs> I would thought I would never see the day where medical doctors are now being censored for sharing yeah. the data clean data no political agenda behind it just data and it's like if to me that just says a couple of things one the truth movement people who are actually awakened to what's going on around us is much bigger than what the media is letting letting leading on to us to believe um because the doctors are now part of that community and um welcome to the censorship we've joined yeah. the club uh but also it's like to me it's also showing that this is what is needed sometimes to wake people up just as much as you and I have gone through parts of our life where we had to go into the darkest place, the part where it almost seems like no hope to finally find that light again. I feel like this is the spark and not everyone's going to find that light, but I feel like this is the one that's starting to wake people up because people can only stay in their homes for so long before they're yeah. like, I don't want to do this anymore. Like this isn't making sense. And the whole movement is about, and, and it goes down to everything that we've talked about in this entire hour, is something outside of you is going to help you, not you right. are going to help yourself. And that's Absolutely. the biggest and, illusion. Yeah, 100%. And so now that, you know, I've been on this kick of like not putting bad things into my body doing this, I'm going more into a healthy lifestyle now. Like I'm going into uh, supplementation and I'm trying to alkalize my body more. Like you start wanting to do that naturally as you progress into this. Like quitting alcohol was the first step. The second part was, was nutritional supplements. And my sister got me on this Arbonne stuff that I'm taking now that's amazing. And what's crazy about this Arbonne is that she's being censored. So she, she's selling these supplements from Arbonne, which, which she's got me on, on board with her doing as well. But you're not allowed to say certain things anymore. So you're not allowed to say cleanse. You're not allowed, the F, the Federal Trade Commission told her you're not allowed to say cleanse. You're not allowed to say healthy, preventative. You're not allowed to say, uh, and, and all these products are like probiotics. Uh, they're all nutritional supplements, but they're not allowed to preach this, the, the benefits of them anymore. They're cracking down on that. And they're saying, oh, it's because the COVID-19. It's because of uh, the coronavirus. That's why you can't say it. We don't want people being misled. It's like, you're crazy. This is health. Like we're trying to help people with this. Like, like I'm a firm believer in these products and I'm like, wow, Trish, you can't say these things at all. She goes, no. And you can't um, imply how much you can't say like, Oh, I had my best month. You can't brag about how much, how, how good you're doing in the industry anymore. Like they're cutting down on us. It's complete communism. This is insane. And like for this to be happening, I was pissed. I was like, dude. And then, then and then her CEO was like telling her, but yeah, we got to, we got to listen to this and abide by the rules and we got to be censored. We can't hashtag cleanse. We can't hashtag 
health. We can't hand, hashtag preventative. Uh, you know, they only want you believing in that unless it's a pill you can take from a doctor. And so that pissed, pissed me off to no degree. I was like, oh, And now, now they're in the movement of removing the doctor so the pharmaceutical company can get to you directly. Yes. It, it's like that's what's happening. They don't need right the middlemen anymore. They don't need the, the drug pusher. Now they're just saying, you know what? Eh, we don't need them anymore. We're just going to give you the drugs right off. You know, it's crazy. Yeah. It is so insane. But um, listen, that's the war we're in right now. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a war that we're in right now with the Trump administration bringing back a republic, and kicking these parasites and and evil entities out of this country. These, this, uh, you know, these special interests and uh, globalist uh, mind control, MK Ultra, sick pedophiles that are running this world, kicking them the hell out of here. We got a clean house. That's why when he went in, when he first got him put in office, put into office, and I don't. That he said we're going to drain the swamp, the deep state, and this is a process. This is not something. Oh, you're out, you're out. No, this is there's legalities and uh, rights and lefts and turns you got to make and twists and turns. It's a hard process. It's a war. That's what we're going through right now. That's the the COVID nineteen is a real deal thing we're hit with. But they the globalists have their agenda. Trump has hit his agenda. And I know there's people that hate Trump. Okay, you don't like his personality. You don't you don't like the orange guy. Blah blah blah, this and that. But you better start paying attention. Pay attention to what's happening here, and you better get on the on the right side of the line because you're on the wrong side right now. The line has been drawn in the sand, and you better get on board. Um, yeah, amen to that. And I think you know it's interesting. I've I've been having some friends recently reach out to me who were like just could never understand my support of Trump, um, and uh, they're finally like, wow, I'm starting to see why he's benefiting the movement. Like you know, like very spiritual people, but just couldn't understand it. And I'm like. The media, when we talk about this idea of manufacturing identity, they've manufactured an identity around him that is false. It doesn't yeah. exist. and they They're take subscribing it. to a delusion. Yeah. And when you start to see it, and it doesn't take much effort to actually see it. And this isn't about, you know, you need to love him or like love Trump or whatever. It's not about that. It's about... Yeah, you don't need to like him. No, but it's about starting to really understand who's manipulating your mind and manipulating your emotions more importantly because it's your emotions that really drive everything and so to me it's like i just see him trying to bring in positivity through his pr press briefings and not saying we're going to do this but like suggestions and all of a sudden it's taken into um like oh he's telling us to drink bleach or oh like whatever oh, and i'm God. like oh, the fact that they take that literally i'm like what is your iq <laughs> Because honestly, like how this man cr created a company, a a billionaire. This man is a is a mega billionaire, dude. He's a, he's he's a very bright guy. Just because he doesn't express himself the way you want him to express himself does not mean he's not bright. Um, he is a very intelligent man. And dude, if you're taking the fact that he said. The guy, look, he has a hard. He's the president of the United States. His job is frustrating. It's tiring. He's gonna say things here and there that maybe he was too tired or he was just like fed up or frustrated with people, and he just says some shit. I do all the time. Everyone does. You can't understand that and put it in a separate category and go. He said that obviously he was being sarcastic and he's probably frustrated at the moment or something was going on. If you can't identify that and you're taking it literally, like, oh, he said we need to go inject bleach or swallow bleach, you're an idiot. I'm sorry, you're just an idiot. That's just it. I, 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 that's yeah. the way I go with it. <laughs> and I think, like, if you're taking it that literally, then there's something wrong with you. Well, and I think this is where it really has to, we're, you know, we're kind of moving into a time now where if you aren't able to disengage from an emotional perspective and really start to observe information in a factual way. Like for instance, those doctors from California were presenting information in just a very factual way, not making it an emotional um, debate, which media loves to do. Wherever you, if my advice to people when they're trying to find out the truth about anything is go to a source that isn't manipulating your emotions. Because right. that is the best way where you can then receive the information without getting triggered into a state of fear or anger or whatever it is. And, uh, and then just look at it and then compare it against other places and see what's not matching up. Right. And a lot of people have to do. 
right? A lot of people tell me like, oh, you're a Trump supporter, so you watch Fox. I'm like, no, actually, I don't. I look I at this at a whole different, a different level. I don't watch any of the controlled media. They're brainwashing you from Fox to CNN. You're just, what side of the aisle are you on if they're brainwashing? So I, I get all my, my, my uh, research done on my own, and I feel like that's what everyone should do, especially now in quarantine. Start looking into things. You got to dig deep, though. Um, and it's there. The information is there for everybody. Just don't be lazy and don't ask. I have ugh, so many liberal friends that want to fight me tooth and nail and debate me. And all their facts stem from CNN. It's, it's, uh, and they'll argue with you till they're blue in the face. And I'm just like, dude, <laughs> I can't do it. I can't do it anymore. You're driving me nuts. You know what I mean? You're driving me insane. I can't do it. You know, so uh, I just learned to change it, change the channel with them pretty quick. And then, uh, you know, if people are listening to this, this uh, video, then, go, you know, more power to them. But uh, yeah, I don't even, my liberal friends, I've just learned to just keep them as friends and like, you know, we'll go out, we'll go take the doom buggy out, we'll go four wheeling, we'll go shooting guns. Oh, they don't like to shoot guns or not. They don't go shooting guns, but uh, different things, you know. But I just, I just keep them at arm's length and just not until they start coming to terms with shit and coming to me and asking me questions that make sense. Then I'll start talking to them. But the ones that are hard nosed liberals that just don't want to see anything outside their little realm of existence, I don't even go there with them. Yeah. And I, and, and, you know, I think it's important to, I always try to keep a frame of reference in that too, especially for anyone who's, I'm sure I have liberal listeners in my audience um, who are, do not like Trump at all. And, you know, when I had, you don't I have to like him, you don't no, have but, to like him. I didn't say it's not a, it's not a personality contest. No, you don't have the, to like him. You should, you know, understand what's going on though on a global scale. The thing before, like when I originally started this podcast, I had a couple other co-hosts on and one of them um, was very liberal, um, like not extreme liberal, but, but liberal and he did not like Trump at all. And we, I liked having convers, I like having conversations with him because, you know, he's, sometimes he gets emotional and so do I, I can get triggered really easily as soon as someone starts to get really heated. Um, but we're still amazing friends. We respect one another. And in just because him and I see things differently doesn't mean we're our friendships over, right. you know? Right. Um, and I think that's where we have to really remember too, is that I just try to hold in my heart that it's not people that we need to be upset with. It's the media because they're constantly programming the minds. And of course, everyone has their own choice to be sovereign and, and walk away. But it's, if it's incessant in the way it is, and they've got a they've got a stranglehold to like your iPhone, your Samsung, like you're gonna get your news, and it's all gonna be liberal, and like you think like this is just how everyone's thinking because it gives you the yeah. false falsehood of the illusion that oh this is just how everyone's thinking. Illusion, illusion of choice. Yeah. Coke okay. and Pepsi. <laughs> let's let's end on a positive note here, and I'm just curious because you're like you're six five, you're a big dude but you're spiritual. Do you do any like meditation or anything like that? Like what's your kind of. Um, I just, well, my meditation, I pray the rosary and that's meditation for me. Um, and I just recently started doing that because my father got sick and he had to go in for a heart valve replacement. It came in a time of, a of, a the COVID-19 scare, well, there were everything we're going on now. So he was in the hospital and he's 85 and I didn't know if I was going to see my dad again. And I was talking to Jim Caviezel a lot at that time. He was calling me. He's a good friend of mine. The guy that played Jesus in the Passion of Christ. Good man. And uh, he was calling me once or twice a day talking to me and he got me started on praying the rosary and really focusing on God. And, and uh, that's just something I'm sticking with now and I'm, I'm trying to do every day once a day you know at least and that's my form of meditation everybody's form is different but that's just mine and, uh, yeah and i just feel like you know during that scary time in my life with my father being in the hospital he's in there 17 days straight where we couldn't have visit we couldn't visit him or anything because of the virus it was on lockdown i didn't know if i was gonna see him again he had a heart valve replacement at 85 and a pacemaker put in and he got pneumonia so three things we were battling in the hospital. And for an older guy at 85, 
I just thought I was going to kiss his ass goodbye. I thought it was gone. I thought it was over. And he pulled through, and he's home now recovering. And uh, I got onto that, 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 that uh, I want to say it's a clear structured path now where I want to, I want to continue doing that. And that's my form of meditation, you know? So that's uh, what I'm going to continue doing. That's, that's my meditation is just praying the rosary, but that's me. And I can only speak for myself. I don't suggest anyone else do it. I'm not telling anybody else to do it. I know some people think of it like, Oh my gosh, he says he's spiritual, but yet he's so religious and he's no. Cause when I'm focusing and I'm praying the rosary, I'm focusing on the prayer and I'm focusing on the, what I'm saying. And, and I'm in touch with God. So that's just my personal way of doing it. I think meditation can happen in many different forms. And I think this idea or concept that it happens when you're in cross-legged position, you know, chanting with your, uh, whatever yeah. it is, that that's really um, just one version of meditation. I know for me, running is a, a form of meditation. Oh, yes. Yes. I was just going to say that running. Yeah. Um, and I would even go for so far as to say, and this is really new to me, just since I kind of, um, started spending more time in the States is because uh, I grew up in Canada. I grew up very liberal. I grew up in the liberal education system and I had to break free of a lot of that over the last where, few Where years. are you now? I'm in Colorado. Oh, I love Colorado. Yeah. I go to Crestone all the time. Yeah. And so yeah. I got introduced to guns and going to the gun range and I, I'm going to be, this is going to sound like totally weird, but to me, that's a form of meditation. Yeah. And people are going to be like, that's crazy. But like, you need to be focused. There's something you want to get in touch with your breath. You know, like it's really about control, which meditation is very disciplinary. Like there's, there's so many different things. If, if, I think if you can release the judgment around what, what it is, it's basically anything that gets you back connected to you in that moment. The in source. that presence. Yeah. Yeah. Like when I was boxing, my meditation was hitting the bags, training, shadow boxing, but all this, I was in the moment. And running keeps you in the moment. When you're running on the treadmill or you're running the mountain or whatever, you're just thinking about that that task at hand. So, or working outside, gardening, uh, you know, and I plant tomatoes or whatever I do. Like that's meditation. So yeah, it's it's things that keep you in the moment at that moment. You're in that moment, and I think that's very important. You know, just what do they say? Idleness is the devil's workshop. Yeah, yeah. So tell our audience about your book when the lights go out. Um, before we uh, finish up yeah uh, the book when the lights go out I wrote when I had back surgery and my career was over and I was basically laid up in bed and I had nothing else to do so I wrote the whole book on my iPhone <laughs> texting <laughs> and I wrote 300 pages with my thumb and uh, I finished it in a month and uh, we put it out I put it out on Amazon and there it is and it's for everyone to see and, and, and it was during a time in my life that I was really frustrated and angry but i had to it was very cathartic to write the book because it was therapy and i needed to just regurgitate just just unload everything that was in my mind at the time that i was going through with that career so during the, when that book was was written with which was 2016 uh it was a, during a time in my life that i was letting go in the process of letting go so that's why the book is very important to me because that's i literally wrote the book and shut the book on my life and it's called When the Lights Go Out on Amazon. Wow. That's powerful. And letting go is a process that's very difficult for people. Yeah. It's and that really book was all about letting go. So I don't even know if I could ever write a book again. I want to write another book called Border Boys. And I want it to be about growing up on the border, you know, but me and my friends, how we grew up with completely different upbringing. Yeah. And uh, with Mexico. I thought about doing that, but uh, gosh, I just don't know. To write a book takes all your energy. It and you got to start it and finish it. A lot of these people tell me like, how did you write a book? How did you finish the book? I'm like, I just, I was obsessed and I just locked myself away. I was laid up in a back surgery. I had nothing else I could do. And I wrote the book. People start and they never finish. You got to be able to finish. That's the hardest. That's the hardest part about writing a book is finishing. And don't second guess yourself so much. When you're writing a book, Trust yourself. Don't keep going back and going, oh, it could be better this way or it could be more perfect like this. Perfectionists never finish sometimes. And that's the problem with being a perfectionist is that you don't finish things. Yeah. That's, so, that's yeah. how um, the ego derails your own success. Yes. And sometimes you just got to trust that it's good enough and put it out. Yeah. 
Well, to our audience, please go um, check out his book and support him. He's doing really good work right now. Um, you've also got um, your friends with um, the the main actor in the movie that's coming out, the documentary. Uh, what is this? The Sound of um, Sound of Freedom. Uh, Freedom. Jim's uh, like a brother to me. Uh, he's a uh, man. He's been such a good friend to me. Great person. Sound of Freedom. He plays Tim Ballard. <clears throat> where they go into tunnels and places that that are demonic and they they break up pedophilia rings and they pull the children out and he's playing the actual guy who's the real hero in all this tim ballard uh t jim's playing the, his role and uh they've i think they just like, a few days ago they went to the premiere or the final cut of it and uh they'll be releasing the trailer one of a trailer got out already but the original, the legit trailer is coming out probably in the next couple of weeks, and I'm gonna pass that along on my end. But it's gonna be a great movie, man. It is. It is so. Be ready to be shaken up to your core, because this movie is gonna go into some places that you're not gonna want to go. That your soul is just not gonna feel comfortable going into. But we have to understand what's going on here. We gotta know what the problem is hand. How children are used as currency, and pedophilia is a real thing, and it goes in many, many different dark levels. And it goes deep, so it's going to be a great movie. Yeah, not only that, it's it's how it's how everything, all corruption is controlled on this planet. It's through the blackmail, using the children, as you said, as currency. And yep. um, if you think, if you can go to the worst place in your mind of what you can think, go a thousand times worse than that, and that's what's happening. Oh, you have no idea. It's it's. I can't say it on this show because it's it, people stop watching, but it's. It's so disturbing, and it's so beyond your imagination. And even um, uh, listen, we're we're dealing with entities and rulers that are not of this world, man. That's all I gotta say. And it's a very disturbing thing to think about, and it's demonic, demonic as hell. Yeah. And um, that, I actually wanted to ask you about the entities because I know you've seen entities all your life. And um, I've seen them um, a couple of times, you know, like uh, it, there's two specific times I've actually seen with my own eyes. Um, but we'll maybe save that for maybe yeah. a future time we can have you back way down the road. But I really appreciate you coming on the show. Um, it, you're doing really great work. And um, I know you don't like to be called a hero, but there are a lot of heroes out there right now. And you're one of them. And a lot of, a, a lot of you guys out there can be doing the exact same thing in your own way. Uh, it's, it's, you know, you've got to make the choices. You've just got to step up. You've got to show up like, you know, David is saying, and all of you guys have the capacity to, to, to be that. Um, so thanks David for being an inspiration and showing people how it's done. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. And you've been a great host. This has been an entertaining show and you do a great job at what you do and keep it up. Thank you. Thank you to the audience. Um, if you need any information about David, I'm going to leave it in the show notes below. So please, uh, you'll find the links there. And I uh, love you guys so much. Please share this episode far and wide. We need to wake up everyone who's asleep to all of this. There's some really great information in this show. Thank you for your support. And I'll be back with you next week. Thank you all for joining our show. We appreciate you tuning in and supporting us. If any of you have any questions you would like answered on the show or any guests that you would like to hear on our show, please email that information to us at info at enlightenup.us or send us a voice message using the Anchor app. There's a super cool feature on there that allows you to send us a message or ask us a question with a touch of a button right from the app. And please continue to support us by following us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. And if you haven't checked out Nicole's channel on YouTube yet, head on over there for some more insight from her, or you can visit her website, inflexibleme.com, where you can book a personal coaching session or a tarot reading, watch some of her most informative videos, or you can sign up for her newsletter. And if you're interested in some light language healing, head to my YouTube channel, lisaloveslove.com, or send me an email to lisa at lisaloveslove.com to inquire about your own personal reading. Thank you again for joining us and supporting us, and we'll be back with you all next week.